Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian here at the Surface Navy Association's annual conference and trade show in Northern Virginia, the number one gathering of U.S. Navy surface warfare leaders and indeed leaders from the Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard team. Our coverage here is in partnership with uh, the Surface Navy Association and sponsored by Huntington Ingalls Industries, General Electric Marine, L3 Technologies, and Leonardo DRS. And we're here at the Lockheed Martin Super Stand here to talk to my old friend Paul Lemo. Uh, Paul, uh, congratulations. You're the Vice President and General Manager uh, of the Integrated uh, um, uh, Warfare Systems and Sensors uh, uh, business. Um, boy, such a long time from uh, Morristown, uh, 20 years ago. And our, we were just talking about our uh, mutual friend, Fred Masali, uh, who was a, a giant in the business. Uh, one, of the, one of the last true great battleship captains uh, uh, as well. Um, you guys have uh, so much capability across the, the the portfolio, and I'm going to try to stick to what's what's your uh, what's what's in your bailiwick yeah, in sure. terms of uh, the integrated warfare systems and the sensor side of things. But we're we're seeing sort of a renaissance of naval power. Uh, Navy is getting more money, looking at putting more ships forward. Uh, the littoral combat ship program is is uh, is is moving ahead. Obviously, the frigate program and the large surface combatant, and you guys are going to be are playing directly in this and are expected to play a critical role uh, going forward. Um, we're going to talk to uh, your, your your colleague, Mr. DiPietro, about the LCS more specifically, but um, this is an integrated effort on the part of both of the contractors in the Navy to get these ships out and get them deployed. Uh, you know, the good news is you guys also have hulls that are sold to Saudi Arabia, uh, so any lessons learned and any capability driven will be appreciated by that customer uh, as well. Talk to us a little bit from your side of the business, how you guys are supporting this entire endeavor to get these ships out. Sure, sure. Well, good to see you again, Vago, and uh, it's great to be back and working with the Surface Navy. And, you know, the Surface Navy show, let me just put in a plug for this, it continues to grow every year, and, and we really view this as kind of the kickoff of our year to kind of set out the innovative things that we're going to be talking to the Navy about throughout the year. Um, you know, you mentioned LCS, and I'll just touch on that. I really feel like, you know, our program has hit its stride. I mean, we are in full rate production. We've been you know, producing two ships a year. In fact, we probably had our most productive year last year. We we delivered uh, two ships. We got three through acceptance trials. We commissioned two, we launched two. So, you know, there's there's a squadron of ships down in Mayport now of LCS Freedom variant ships, and, and they're ready to be put to sea and deploy. And I know Joe's going to talk to you more about that, but uh, it's, it's a great program, and I think it's providing the Navy with the capability they need, the flexibility, and the agility that those ships provide. Um, let me take you to what are some of the other uh, keynote features, right? The things you're highlighting at this show, I mean, it's an opportunity, as you said, you know, it, it starts the year off with a bang. Uh, I'm an SNA uh, life member, so, uh, and, a, and a proud one, but I mean, this really is the start of the year. It's a tremendous show because the leadership is all here. It's on a human scale also, so you see uh, a, lot, a, 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 lot of, a lot of the leadership that are coming through here. But what are your priority items, um, you know, at, at this time when, you know, again, the Navy is trying to rejuvenate so many of its products and really set itself on kind of a, a great power strategic yeah. course. So, you know, Aegis is a big part of our portfolio. In fact, uh, as I've told others, we're coming up on 50 years from the first Aegis contract in 1969, December of 69. So, Wayne, uh, Wayne Meyer, uh, right, the father of Aegis. Absolutely. And uh, the, the, the system continues to evolve and be upgraded. You know, today it is a fully open architecture system and it's modularized. We have something called the Common, common Source Library, uh, which basically is a collection of software components of capability. And it's allowed us to deploy that capability on other classes of ships, like LCS, like the National Security Cutter for the Coast Guard and international ships. Um, but back to Aegis, you know, we are really here talking a lot about our Baseline 9 capability. You know, Baseline 9 is the first fully integrated air and missile defense capability, so we can do both simultaneously. Um, and then also Baseline 10, and we're working very closely with the Navy and with Raytheon, the SPY-6 contractor, to integrate that new sensor onto the, the platform and, and a whole host of new capabilities in Baseline 10 that'll be coming out. I think the biggest change in Aegis over the years is that you know, we've been able to make um, the system agnostic to sensors and weapons. You know, it used to be that you had to have Aegis with SPY-1 and you had to have it with certain missiles and now we've kind of opened that up. If you look at some of the international programs that we've won associated with Aegis, like in Australia and Canada, um, those are going to be integrated with new radars, not right. SPY-1, not SPY-6. 
different radars and uh, and it's different. going to be with the Samson, uh, the the British radar is going to be going on those ships. If no. I recall, no. So in Australia, uh, for the new Hunter class C five thousand, it's with a CEA radar, and in uh, Canada, it'll be a new Lockheed Martin solid state radar. So as you know, as we're showing, we can we, the system is open. We can integrate with different sensors, different weapons, and other effectors. Uh, so we're talking a lot about Aegis and Aegis modernization as well. You know, there's baseline nine can be backfit on a number of platforms in the uh, Arleigh Burke class, and uh, we're we're talking to the Navy about a lot of that. I would also say we're talking about LCS modernization. So now we have these ships out there, and uh, there's been a lot of work done to add capability, like the Naval Strike Missile. And, uh, and other things, and we've been talking a lot about how to accomplish that, how to get these LCSs upgraded and become more lethal. Uh, we're, we're also talking about some of our new innovations. So um, the Helios uh, program for the Navy is gonna put a laser weapon system on an Arleigh Burke destroyer, and I think the neat thing about it, it's gonna be fully integrated with the Aegis combat system. And uh, th that'll you know make it just another weapon uh, at the disposal of the commander of the ship to use, whether it's a kinetic effector or they go to a laser weapon uh, to take out the, uh, the threat. Uh, we're pretty excited about that program. Uh, we're talking also a lot about uh, broadband electromagnetic apertures. Uh, this is an investment we've made. We certainly see the future being common apertures for radar communications and electronic warfare. Um, kind of declutters the top side of ships, and the technology has really come along to allow us to do that. We can have very wide bandwidth systems that can cover all these different functions. So those are, you know, just a few of the things we're highlighting here. Um, it's uh, it's a, a very interesting, exciting, and interesting time. And uh, it was, and I'm sorry for following up uh, on the, on the radar side. I don't know what I was thinking. It was a little bit of a misfire. So thank you very much for correcting me. Um, Let's talk a little bit about Aegis and the growth strategy for it. You guys obviously, you know, massive investment on the part of the Navy, massive internal investment you guys have directed to that. Um, was a little bit of a setback from your guys' perspective because Raytheon did win the AMDR, but that's why the combat system is disaggregated from, uh, from the radar, although well integrated into it. But talk to us a little bit about the standardization drive the Navy wants to get to. We talked to Ron Boxel, the Director of Surface Warfare, uh, yesterday, Rear Admiral Boxel, and one of the things that he made clear is, look, the, the importance for ensuring that, that we get these baselines and they get this, you know, have a commonality in combat systems and try to get everybody as close to it. We talked to Brian McGrath, a Naval uh, strategist uh, as well, and Brian was like, look, it's very, very important to try to not have all of these multiple different blocks and try to get an even capability. How are you working with the Navy to try to achieve that goal where there is a rather wide disparity as you go through the fleet about what are missile, miss, ballistic missile defense ships, what aren't, and, and now we're looking at this as saying, hey, we need to have this capability stretch across and even give a flight 2A capability to the LCSs right. eventually, right. Or, or the frigate, excuse me, I should say, uh, in order to be able to give that sort of um, DDG-51 minus kind of capability. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that's a great point. And one of the things that we've heard over the years is the number of Aegis baselines. There's a significant number out there, and, and everyone would like to see more commonality. Certainly, we think the introduction of the common source library is a way to get there, um, to have that commonality across not only the Aegis fleet, but again, LCS and Coast Guard ships, et cetera. And we've been spending a lot of effort you know, to, to, to make sure that the system is open, because one of the things we want to do is, is have it be a little bit more like an Apple iPhone, right? Where, where others can develop apps for it, that they don't all have to come from Lockheed Martin. And so that's what we're, we're working towards. Uh, the system is open, you know, everyone will understand what, what the core infrastructure looks like, and now others can develop a specific application that could, could run in that common system library and be put on the ships, and therefore you're getting continuous competition uh, right. within the program. Um, from uh, a, um as, as you adapt the combat system, right? I mean, you talked about, for example, a Coast Guard version, an LCS version. How do each one of these baselines sort of differ, right? Because you have the full-up suite that's in the cruiser and on the destroyer force. Sure. What is that um, smaller interpretation of the system? I know you guys have pioneered this a little bit with your Navantia partner on the F-100 and others, but give, give folks sort of a sense on what this smaller kind of a capability, because when people think of the, the LCS, they don't think of somebody who's equipped with an Aegis combat right. system any more than, you know, having been aboard the NSC and it's a terrific ship, the National Security Cutter 
you know, it was not originally envisioned to have that kind of a combat system on it. Yeah, so, you know, if you think about an Aegis weapon system, right, you're talking about undersea warfare, surface warfare, anti-air, missile defense, and so you've got your software components, your modules that cover each one of those, and then when we'll go to a ship, let's say like a Coast Guard cutter that doesn't have those capabilities, we're just taking the core things that we need. Generally, the C4I, you know, situational awareness. Um, that ship does have a gun, so it's going to have a the gun weapon system module. So we're basically just taking the components that that particular platform needs for the capability that it has, and and leaving out all the complicated, you know, missile defense pieces and so forth. Um, as you look at. You know, one of the other things was the large surface combatant, right? A lot of discussion about this evolutionary path as we look at LCS, build up LCS capability, develop the frigate uh, in concurrence then, right? I, I mean, it's it's a very, very exciting period. I mean, in, in 20, uh, later this year, you get the frigate requirement, uh, and I want to ask you a little bit about that. Uh, you get the frigate requirement, then uh, you're uh, down-selected on the frigate next year, and then in 23, the idea is to be able to down-select to the new uh, surface combatant. As you look at this continuum, what's sort of the strat the Lockheed strategy of sort of the lessons learned on, on LCS, what gets applied to Frigate, what then from Frigate goes and gets applied to this new large uh, surface combatant, given that you're integral throughout the whole you know, naval food chain right now? Yeah. Well, it, you know, it is an exciting time for the Navy. Uh, a lot of investment going into the surface Navy. And by the way, I'll make a point that we're seeing the same thing internationally that um, I call it Aegis 2.0. I mean, we've, we've had a whole host of new business internationally around Aegis. So really what we're seeing is fleets worldwide are recapitalizing their navies. But you know, back to the question that you asked, I mean, there's sort of two components, right? There's sort of the combat system side, and I would argue the lesson learned from LCS is really positive. I mean, we were able to, to develop the combat system for LCS with very little effort. I mean, I'm talking single digit millions of dollars way back when we did that, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, because we, we were in the process of modularizing and opening the Aegis weapon system to this common source library. And we took the pieces we need and we created the, the LCS combat system. So I think the lesson learned there is we're going to do the same as we move into the large surface combatant, into the frigate. Um, you know, we've already been selected as, as the combat system integrator for the frigate uh, for certainly the first period of time. And um, we're going to basically leverage that common source library into that. You know, from a shipbuilding perspective, because uh, we are a prime on LCS, certainly a lot of lessons learned there about you know how to how to take a design uh, from from the beginning, uh, or I should say from a parent hull, which LCS had a parent hull, uh, and frigate will as well. How to take that and modify it and, and meet all the Navy requirements and ensure that you know you're providing the capability that they need. And we'll be taking those lessons learned forward, you know, on those programs. Do you think that the LCS win in Saudi Arabia, which actually is almost a frigatized version of the ship, gives you an edge, you think, in, in the frigate competition? Uh, you know, the frigate is a, is a different ship. There's a kind of a different set of requirements. It's, it's actually a larger ship. Uh, I would say from the standpoint of how to put together a multi-mission surface combatant, it certainly helps, uh, but we have a lot of experience from Aegis as well. Uh, but yeah, it, it is really a different ship. The frigate is, is probably going to be, you know, 6,000 tons plus. Um, it's going to be a lengthier ship and, and have lots of capability on it. Um, as you look at uh, sensor capabilities, and I'm getting getting the high sign to before you get uh, hauled off because there's going to be a ceremony here, and, and very much, you know, uh, thanks for uh, uh, the SNA scholarships yes. are, are coming up. Really so uh, kudos, uh, kudos to you for uh, sponsoring that. Um, as you look at integrated sensor, EW, the whole package that falls under your portfolio, and you're looking out 10 years for the kind of capabilities that are going to be necessary, given the insight you have on the threat, which is a pretty intimate insight. What, what, are, what are some of the capabilities that you guys will be developing and fielding and helping and working with the Navy to develop to get the force to be able to see farther, see better, and especially um, in a highly contested electromagnetic environment where there's going to be jamming I mean, it's it's going to be a, a an atmosphere. I think that, that nobody in history has experienced really. Um, you know, the, the violence of what could be future war uh, with two great power adversaries that have a lot of capabilities that are very very similar. Yeah. Let me actually start with what we're doing today. So you may be familiar with the long range discrimination radar that we're building for the Missile Defense Agency. It's going to be located up in Clear, Alaska. 
The architecture that we've put together for that we think is is very uh, unique and, and why is that? It's it's a scalable, so it's based on a scalable subarray suite building block. And in that subarray suite, there's a lot of special features to get at what you talked about in terms of, you know, electromagnetic environment and challenges from adversaries in that environment. Probably can't talk too much more about that, but but that subarray suite building block is what we are using on all the solid state radar offerings we have going forward, whether it be the uh, Homeland Defense Radar for Hawaii, which we won, or Aegis Ashore in Japan, or the Canadian Surface Combatant Radar, and that allows us to scale the radar down or up to the size and the power levels we need to see as far as they want to see, see as close in as they want to see, address some of those electromagnetic threats. So we're pretty excited about that architecture. We've invested a lot in it, and it seems to be uh, paying dividends now with some new business for us. And uh, why is it important for you guys to uh, uh, sponsor the SNA scholarships? Well, as I'm sure you know, Vago, STEM is, is critical, not only for Lockheed Martin, but for our entire industry. Uh, but for Lockheed Martin, we do invest a lot of money every year in STEM scholarships and just getting out into schools and, and talking about STEM activities and how important they are to us because the workforce of the future uh, is, is out there. We need to get them interested in, uh, in science, technology, engineering, and math and coming to do the and solve the hard problems that we solve for the Navy. And we got to keep that pipeline of talent going. And so we think, you know, having these scholarships is a great way to do that. Paul Lemo, Vice President and General Manager right. of Integrated Warfare uh, Systems and Sensors here at Lockheed Martin. Yep. Paul, fair winds following seas. Thank you. Uh, and thanks so much for uh, for doing this. We got to grow the new generation of Pauls, man. Right. Otherwise, we're in trouble. Absolutely. I look forward to talking to you again. Thanks again. All right. Thanks. See ya.